How often do you have those moments when you think to yourself, my goodness, I'm paying a lot in taxes. There's no way I'm getting equivalent services from the provincial government back in return. Well, the Financial Accountability Office of Ontario was asked to look into that to see whether it was fact or fiction. And what they discovered may surprise you. Peter Weltman is Ontario's Financial Accountability Officer. His office is an independent, nonpartisan provincial agency, and his latest number crunching adventure now brings him to our studio. Welcome. Nice to have you back it's here. It's great to be back here. Let us start with some background before we get to what your findings were. The study of how much we pay in taxes and how much we get back in services, I gather, started with a simple request from an MPP? It was a simple request from an MPP because it was a complex project. So we like to do complex projects on request from an MPP. <clears throat> and the request was very much, my constituents tell me, some of them tell me that they seem to be paying a lot in taxes and they seem to think that they can buy most of the services they're getting from the government on their own at a cheaper cost than what they're paying for in taxes. That was sort of the way this person characterized it to us. And this was over three years ago when he came to us, and we've been sort of working at it ever since. Uh, but it takes a lot of, this is, we did a lot of data crunching, making a few assumptions, trying to figure out how best to illustrate uh, to get to his point. So we weren't able to exactly identify how much folks are paying, you know, or could pay. But what we ended up with was, what do people pay and what do they get back? What's the value of the services they get back? Did you think that you knew the answer to this question before you did the number crunching? Well, we had a pretty fair idea. We have a, we have a progressive tax system, so we know folks that make more money pay more tax. We also know that a lot of programs are targeted to folks who are not high income, and we expected them to be beneficiaries of more programs. What we didn't know, though, is the actual dollar value of those benefits that we're going back. It's pretty simple to find out how much people pay in taxes, but I presume it's more complicated to find out what's the cost of educating your child? What's the cost of going to a hospital? What's the cost of using the court system? What's the cost of using provincial parks, et cetera, et cetera? How do you even begin to accumulate all that information? Well, the first step was to decide how are we going to divide the people up? So <clears throat> are we gonna look at individuals or families? And we looked at families and we thought, okay, so we have 66 and a half million families in Ontario. And we did families because most programs in Ontario <coughs> are geared towards families. And then we said, let's divide them in 10, income deciles. So we know we can do that. We know what the income categories are. So we know, for example, the first one is zero to, I think it's off the top of my head, 20 and change. And then the top one is, starts at $188,000 a year and goes up from there. And so that's how we started it off. And then we found that we looked at example family size and we know if you have more people in your family, you're going to use more public services. If you have more kids, you're going to use more education. If you have, you're going to use more health care. Those are the two big ones. So there's an iterative process and then at the same time trying to find the data necessary to, to, to be, you know, make a reasonable assumption as to what everybody gets and what everybody spends. Shall we put people out of their misery now and show them what you found? Why sure, don't we do that? let's do that. We are going to show a, a series of graphics now to help people understand your work. And this is, again, a simple reflection of how much people pay in in taxes and the value of what they get back in services and whether they're putting more in or getting more out. So, Sheldon. The six and a half million families that Peter Weltman just referred to, this is for the fiscal year 2019-2020. So before the pandemic hit, people paid to Ontario in taxes a little over $23,000 on average. They received from Ontario in services a little over $24,000 in average. So the net benefit for the average Ontarian was $846 to the plus. So on average, we get more out than we put in, yes? That's exactly right. And in fact, the first six income deciles, if you will, are, the, are net beneficiaries. The next two are neutral, if you like. They put in about the same amount as they get out. <clears throat> and the top two income deciles put in more than they get back in the value of services. So these are averages, important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Every in individual circumstance is gonna be different. So if you have people in your family who are, who are very sick, for example, and they're spending a lot of time in hospital or wherever, they're using up and getting a lot of healthcare benefit and vice versa. And there will be some people who won't have to go to the hospital for, for a very long yeah, time. Yeah, for a very hopefully. long time. Yeah. Well, let's just amplify on what you just said there. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up board two here, because remember, we're looking at six and a half million families in the province of Ontario, <clears throat> 3.9 million families 
will be net beneficiaries. That's 60% of the families in the province of Ontario get more back in services than they put in in taxes. 1.3 million families, it's neutral. Essentially, it's a wash. They put in, they take out, it's about the same amount. 1.3 million families are net contributors. Again, 20% of families put more in than they take out. What do you infer from the way that breaks down? Well, it makes sense to, to a large degree. As I said before, most government programs are geared towards helping those who are lower income, who are disadvantaged in some way. Um, so for example, things like um, <clears throat> housing affordability, a lot of that benefit is on the lower income side of things. Um, things like healthcare though are interesting, that distribution is fairly even right across all income deciles. So this is something, this sort of result we would expect. I wasn't expecting the 60% number to be quite as high as it is. I wasn't uh, expecting the neutral side to be as, as, as wide as it was. Mm. And certainly I think I was expecting on the higher side to, to see there as, as net contributors. Does this suggest, Peter, that if 60% of the people are taking out more than they're putting in, and for 20 it's a wash, that essentially that higher income earning 20% are floating pretty much everybody? Yes, that's exactly right. And you'll see that in most in most places that have a progressive tax system. And I think the thing to keep in mind too, that, that top 10%, if you will, <clears throat> the distribution there is incredibly exponential. So it's not, uh, it's much, much wider in terms of income. It starts on 180,000. Let's do this, actually. We got these numbers right here. Sheldon, if you would, uh, third board, if you would, and let's do it by income gap. So if you make less than $76,300 a year, you are a net beneficiary. You're part of that 60% we talked about. If you earn between 76,300 and 131,500, it's neutral, it's a wash. And then here's the group we were just talking about. If your household income is more than $131,500, you're part of that 20% that is a net contributor. We are frequently hearing, mostly I think from progressive politicians, that uh, the better off in society are making out like bandits while the little guy's getting screwed. Does this put a lie to that? Well, I think what's nice about doing this sort of report is it lays it out there. It tells people, here's what it is. You may think it's something. <clears throat> Bandit is a loaded term. <laughs> Everybody has their own definition of it. Uh, but I think what we've been able to do is to say, here, is the, here are the facts, here are the numbers, here is what people are putting in. And if you think about the top decile, for example, um, that their contribution is on average 17% of their income. Uh, hmm. On the bottom decile, the, on the bottom two deciles, the average benefit is, I think it's about 249% of their income. So there's a significant benefit on the back end, on the bottom end, if you will, of the income spectrum. And the top end of the income spectrum, maybe not as high as some people think. Um, maybe higher than some people think, but that's what it is. And I think it's nice to be transparent and be able to put that out there. Do you prefer Robin Hood as opposed to make out like bandits? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> Oliver Wendell Holmes, famous Supreme <laughs> Court judge, said taxes are the price of a civilized society, and that's you know largely what you get. And I think I want to throw something else in there too. Hmm. On the top end, yes, people put in a lot, but there are some intangible benefits that I think benefit folks at that top end probably in some respects more so than the bottom end, and that would be things like the administration of justice, enforceability of contracts. Mm -hmm. You get to build wealth by buying and selling, investing in businesses, hiring people, all those sorts of things that are enforceable by contract. And if you haven't got a system, a justice system that allows you to enforce those contracts, it becomes a wild west. Mm. And it doesn't give you the same level of business confidence to be able to come in and know you can, you can succeed at that level, and I think that's an undervalued service, uh, personally. So if you're making less than $28,000 a year in the province of Ontario, you actually are, you are in the group that is helped the most by the province of Ontario. Yes, that's exactly right. And your right. fellow taxpayers. <clears throat> and if you make more than 188 k a year. You're helping. You're helping a lot more than you're receiving. You're helping a lot of folks. Okay. We have a progressive tax in income tax system, as you pointed out, in the province. The more you make, the more you pay. You go into a higher tax bracket. Do the, I mean, these numbers do suggest that the progressive tax system is working. Do you think the progressivity of the tax system needs to be even more than it is right now? You know, 
<clears throat> That's a great question, especially now coming before an election, because that is certainly questions people should be asking themselves. Should it be more progressive? Should it be you know, less progressive, if you will, or more flatly distributed? So I think what's important is this is the way, this is the way of the world right now in Ontario. This is the distribution. This is how, many, how much people put in. This is how much they get back. Should that change? We have three, four political parties, maybe more, four for sure, that are you know, making news, and they have part platforms. And I think it's incumbent upon anybody running for office to put forward you know, proposals, policies, ideas to suggest if that number should be, should be moved and defend it. I ask a question because uh, two blocks northeast of here is a McDonald's, which I visit far too often. And whether you make $20,000 a year or $500,000 a year, when you go to that McDonald's, you are paying the same level of HST for your burgers, fries, whatever. That's not progressive, that's regressive. Does that make an argument that the financial accountability officer finds appealing that we need more progressivity in our system? <laughs> Let's go on the HST for a second. Certainly, mm -hmm. McDonald's is a place, you know, and it's, unless McDonald's, we're picking on McDonald's. I like Dairy Queen, but that's okay. I find Dairy Queen to be the great equalizer where you have folks who are making 500,000 a year and folks that are making 20,000 a year and they're standing in line waiting for their cones. But back to your question, uh, the other argument on the HST is that often folks in higher incomes are buying higher value products or higher priced products. So they are paying more tax in that respect. They're not always going to line up for the you know, dollar cheeseburger. They might be buying something a little more expensive. So in terms of whether tax systems should be more progressive or not, again, that's a terrific you know, debate to be had before an election and during governing. Uh, okay. You're gonna, can you humor me a little more on this one? I mean, I'm wondering because if, for example, what's it? The HST in Ontario is 13, 8%? Well, 8%, oh, 13, yeah. 13 altogether, but 8, 8 is 8%. the provincial portion. That's right. And every point of sales tax in the province of Ontario brings in... Billions, right? Like seven <clears throat> billion, billion or right. something like that. It's a significant. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but certainly it's a. It's over. Yeah, it's over a billion dollars. If you wanted yeah. the tax system to be even more progressive, to help the little guy more, what if you just a limit? What if it's eight percent? Why wouldn't you just cut it by one point every year for eight years, raise the same amount of money by increasing the income tax, which richer people would pay? By the time the eight years is out, you got no more sales tax, and you got wealthier people paying even more. What would be wrong with that? Well, so now we're riffing on tax policy, and there are people <laughs> that make a living doing this stuff in depth. So a couple things to keep in mind. If you raise income taxes on people who pay a lot of tax, you create an incentive for them to try to find ways to uh, avoid paying that tax. So you have behavioral change, and this has been modeled. I did that in my previous job. Well, I didn't, but we, our office did it in my previous job. So if you get beyond a certain threshold, you create an incentive for folks to try to find a way to minimize the taxes they, they pay. And in some cases, that means they upstakes and leave. And that's not mm. what you want to have happen. So there is a boundary. You, know, you have to be mindful of that. And on the bottom end, there is a tax rebate. There is a GST tax rebate for folks who are earning less money to help them to reimburse them for some of the HSC GST that they've been paying. So some of that is already, is already built in. All right. Let's get back to your study here. You, uh, when you did your briefing for journalists and other interested parties last week, you used the example of, well, when people go to McDonald's, they see the tax that they're paying there, and they might say, oh, boy, I'm paying so much in tax. But I think the example you gave was, you never get a text from the government saying what? Saying, here's your kid was spent, spent a full day in, in kindergarten today, and they also had daycare as part of that kindergarten. And here was the value of that full day in kindergarten. Maybe it was 250 bucks. I'm picking a number out of, mm -hmm. out of the top of my head. But you don't get that. You don't get a text. I mean, maybe that's a really cool idea for somebody to pick up on. Maybe every time you step into a hospital, you get a text saying, you've just been pr provided with you know, $500 worth of medical uh, benefit today because of the procedures that you underwent. That doesn't happen. But you do see the tax, like you said, on the bill. And especially in April, you're seeing the tax as you file your return. Do you think people understand that for the taxes they pay, I think the example you gave was a public education system from K to, K to 12, excuse me, it's not 13 anymore, <laughs> K to 12, it costs $200,000 to educate your kid. That's right. Do people understand that that's what they're paying taxes for? But how would they understand that? Because they don't know what the cost is until some, you know, an office like ours puts it out there. That's the beauty of having an office like ours, and that's, that's what I love about it, is being, being able to put that number out there for folks to look and say, wow, okay, I didn't know. 
I didn't know it cost that much money to educate my kid. I take it for granted because it doesn't cost me out of pocket anything. Let's do a, we'll stick with education here. You start with uh, childcare and you move into the public school system and then you go to post-secondary. So we're talking about a span of who knows what, 20 years, maybe more, more than 20 years. Which groups in society, we broke it down earlier, which groups benefit the most from having a publicly funded child care system, a publicly funded education system, and a significantly publicly funded post-secondary <clears throat> education system? So overall, those with the larger families will benefit the most mm -hmm. because they have more kids using those systems. Mm -hmm. um, when you get through on the child care piece, the care tax credit, et cetera, that benefits mostly the middle income folks. Uh, when you're getting into post-secondary education, that tends to benefit higher income folks because they tend to have uh, more people going into university and they also tend to have adults living at home. So they might have their adult children in post-secondary living at home who therefore are able to obtain all those other benefits. So it does get distributed uh, in different ways for different income groups. The province of Ontario taxpayers subsidize electricity users to the tune of about $6 billion a year. Which income group benefits the most from that <clears throat> subsidy? The lowest income groups benefit the most on a relative basis, meaning relative to their incomes. There are other, so there's a bunch of different subsidies. We did a report on this several months ago. Mm -hmm. Some of those subsidies are specifically income tested. Uh, there are other subsidies that, uh, that, that subsidize for consumption. And the consumption subsidy, which runs about $657 million, give or take, benefits those at the higher income levels because they tend to consume the most electricity because they have the larger homes and the more electrical, electrically charged items to use. I'm, I'm not done on this one. I didn't you, think you, you would You know be. this is a hobby I know horse this of mine, is eh? coming. I, I make a six-figure income. The province of Ontario sends me a check for $8.46 every month to help me pay my hydro bill. Okay, you're a policy guy. Does that make any sense <clears throat> to you? It doesn't make sense to me. And I really try hard to understand the rationale of government policies. So there are two components. It is a political imperative. Mm -hmm. Certainly that was an important component when this whole thing was put together back in the wind government. There was a lot of angst about electricity prices. And I guess the government felt a need to address that angst in some way, shape, or form. But then mm -hmm. there's, a, there's also a policy rationale longer term. So we are effectively borrowing money. We are borrowing money as a government to subsidize electricity consumption for everybody, and those that consume the most happen to be in the higher income brackets. I don't understand the rationale. And yet nobody's done anything about it in the several years that that policy's been in place. How come? Well, maybe part of it is because nobody ever spelt it out that way. I mean, we've put it out. We, it, we've been transparent. The numbers are there. They're posted for everybody to see. As I said before, you don't need special access to get to the FAO. You just go to our website. <laughs> All the reports are there. And hopefully that might engender a debate about whether this is a, a useful policy and what are the merits of the policy and what else could be done with those funds. So the big takeaway from your report then is that for those people who think they're getting screwed by the province because they're not getting value for the taxes they pay, you're saying it ain't so. I have no idea what individual people are thinking about the taxes mm. they pay. I, I really don't. Um, I, you know, when I grew up, I was told if you're paying taxes, it's because you're making money, so you should be happy to pay taxes. I am happy to pay taxes for that reason. Um, but clearly, the value of what people are getting back is significant. And I don't, I myself, I don't think I knew what the cost of public education was, K to 12. That was a neat number for me. The other thing I thought was really interesting is the distribution of the health benefit, fairly even across all inc income deciles, which in our universal system does make sense. And we don't see that in other, in other parts of the world. Peter, we're down to our last 30 seconds. There's a budget coming out this Thursday. There is. What do you want to see? I want to see what <clears throat> the government is proposing. Uh, we've put out a baseline a few weeks ago saying here's what we think. There's going to be a surplus. There's going to be a, a surplus of $7 billion five years from now. I'm guessing that that won't be what's in the government's budget. Because they're going to spend it like crazy. Well, I don't know what they're going to do, but that's what yeah. I want to find out. I want to yeah. find out what they're going to do. I want to find out what the difference is between their forecast and our forecast. And I want to understand the rationale between, you know, what, what is the delta? What is the gap? And why is that? Why is there a gap there? And what is the benefit of that gap to me as a voter? Gotcha. Thanks for coming in. Well, thanks for having me in. That's Peter Weltman, Financial Accountability Officer for the Province of Ontario.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.